So with that, let me turn it over to Larry to walk us through a few very good examples of why it depends. So, so thank you, Jennifer. Um, as, as she said, I'm Larry Alves. I, I, I am the chief medical officer at Neuron Pharmaceuticals, a very small company, a pharmaceutical company, and I spent most of my years uh, as a psychiatrist within, uh, within the pharmaceutical industry. But I'm also an Iowa farmer. Um, and so uh, in terms of the, the theme of food, I come from a part of the country where food is, uh, uh, is really not that great necessarily. I mean, the question, uh, a good tuna casserole with jello salad is considered a, a, an excellent meal as long as there's plenty of it. So, um, so with, so I'm a much simpler person than many of you here, and the, the question that we have, in, rather than uh, uh, what is the recipe, uh, uh, as Greg indicated, it's more, hey, what do you want? And maybe more politely, what is the question? Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and I, that, that, that idea in terms of real world evidence and how we apply it has sort of come up a number of times today, but I'm going to emphasize it a bit more because uh, what I find as I have done my work and actually done uh, a number of clinical trials uh, uh, in, in the area of mental health research and, and real world evidence, the question is often not very well articulated. And even here today, I've heard a, a lot of variation on uh, real world evidence and what exactly it means. Uh, and there's a lot of different sub questions in terms of defining the question. It's sort of who are you talking about? Who are you talking to? What, what is it that you're trying to establish uh, uh, with, with your question, specifically in terms of the treatments that you're doing? How are you trying to do it? When in the context of uh, when, when in the overall course of uh, the treatment, was it done, was the treatment uh, based on treatment context today or treatment context of the future that you're actually looking for because your results are going to come in the future? Or are you basing it on, on the past evidence in some, uh, some cases? How long also, I mean, I haven't heard too much about how long, but uh, the context of how long actually makes a big difference because an outcome after six days may be radically different than after six months or six years or 60 years. Um, Taking that, that question about uh, articulating the question, I think we also have to think about it around what is real world evidence itself. And I would argue that in my work in the pharmaceutical industry and the journey of developing a drug, there's a lot, there's hundreds if not thousands of questions that you're trying to address. And they're basically based on making sure that one, uh, the treatment is safe, and the other is that the treatment is effective. And the, the servants that, are, or the masters that I serve are regulators, not just the FDA, but reg the FDA is one of them, but the European regulators, the Japanese regulators, the, uh, all around the world increasingly so, and also the payers, who's gonna pay for the product that I've developed. So I've got to be very, con uh, 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 very conscious of how they uh, value the question and the answer to what I'm getting. And the key issue along this whole journey is to make sure, most importantly, that the drug is safe. So I start very simply by asking if I give the drug at different doses in animals, is that, does that work? Now that's a real world question too. Uh, uh, it, and to a um, mammalian biologist, it gives a lot of information. And as clinicians, we are mammalian, uh, a very specialized mammalian biologist, so it begins to give an answer. I think our real world questions as we move through that development process evolve over time. And what we're always trying to do is uh, answer more specifically in a particular population, can I expand it to a new question that I have that comes up when I get the answer to the old one? If, the, if I find that the drug is not safe in a rat, 
I'm not going to move much further. Uh, it's unlikely that I will go any further at all. But if it is, I then have to, I want to make sure that it's safe in a healthy human being. And if I try to go to other types of unhealthy human beings, I may uh, be, the results may be confounded because of the, uh, the conditions that are, exist in those other human beings that help me make it very difficult to interpret safety issues with respect to the drug. So it's a very incremental, stepwise process. And so at the other end, the real world evidence in terms of the question that I'm trying to get as a patient or as a, a clinician who's treating that patient is will that drug or will that treatment be safe and effective in me or my patient? And that's, there's never real world evidence to suffic uh, be sufficient for that. Because as an old Iowa farmer who's white and male, my response may be quite different in terms of safety and efficacy, particularly as I get older. I can't get younger. But at the extremes of age, the results are can be radically different. And what I get from just a general population may not answer my, my particular question. So none of that is unlikely that I'm ever going to have sufficient evidence to know for sure whether it will work in me. So the question, as I think as we're going through this development process, is to answer a series of iterative questions that always taking some level of real world evidence, but then trying to, uh, to uh, uh, generalize it beyond a bit to the more particular that, I'm, that I must face and deal with. So with that background, I want to describe a, a, a little bit more of the context that I've been doing uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and in developing treatments and some of the issues uh, that I've tried to focus. And so what, what part of the context, I've already told you who my masters are and who I'm trying to develop it for, but I'm, uh, there's other masters out there as well, besides the regulators and besides the payers, I mean, the, 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 and the patients. There's also the caregivers. There's many other things. Uh, but I also have to be thinking about there's a lot of different components of this real-world evidence. Uh, wh exactly who is the population that I'm working with specifically? Am I working with a healthy human being, or am I working in, in my area with a schizophrenic human being? Am I working with a geriatric schizophrenic human being? Or am I working with a suicidal geriatric schizophrenic human being. And the results of the trial may be different in each of those uh, conditions. And the answers that I'm trying to get may be different. Uh, and specifically, what type of part of the treatment is being restricted or not? Uh, and uh, where will these uh, restrictions be applied? Is it ethical to actually uh, do the, the, make these restrictions or not? And you'll see in the clinical trials that those questions uh, come up. How long are these restrictions going to be in place? It may be that it's OK to, for, from an ethical point of view to restrict it for a short period of time, but a long period of time may be completely unethical. Um, and what is the value of the restrictions? I mean, I think all, overall, there are many, many sub-questions as we try to make, design these trials. And at the end of the day, you have to put them all together in a, in a mixer, as it were, and determine over in making your decisions about each of these points, how are you, uh, what is the value that comes out? Nothing is going to be perfect. I won't ultimately be able to answer for every individual in the human race that will ever be uh, under every condition uh, what the response will be. But is it, for the question that I've well articulated, is it going to apply and be valuable to my masters and my submasters? So in order to help me do this, I've actually been involved in uh, developing, uh, uh, working on a scale that helps me identify within my own clinical trials uh, and in evaluating other clinical trials how real world they are. And the, the sort of the six areas, and this is actually comes from the literature, uh, uh, that, that, that I tend to think about are participant eligibility criteria, the intervention flexibility, the medical practice, and the intervention flexibility in medical practice both should be considered probably independently for the treatment that you're uh, giving, the, the primary tr uh, treatment that you have the questions about, and the comparative treatment as well. Then the follow-up intensity and duration varies, outcome measures that you're looking at, and participant adherence. Uh, it, to the treatment. And these would be all things that one would be considered. And the answers will be different depending on where in this journey of clinical treatment development I am. 
to make sure that, the, uh, that I'm doing it safely, ethically, and answering valuable questions. So I'm going to give two different studies as examples of how, uh, um, uh, how this might be applied in a randomized prospective clinical trial. Uh, that I'm, uh, in terms of, I'm trying to bring it to regulators as well as payers to make sure that they're convinced with their high standards that, it, that it's not only ethical and uh, reliable, but that it also answers a clear question and can be put in, uh, from a drug company point of view, put in the product label. That's always very valuable for, from our perspective and why we might want to uh, try to address that, that question. So the overall goal with this first trial, which is called the INTERCEPT trial, or the International Trial for Suicide Pre Prevention, uh, is to demonstrate whether a specific drug, clozapine, is better than another uh, antipsychotic medication, olanzapine, for reducing the risk of suicidal behavior in patients with, uh, with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder who are shown to be at high risk for suicide. So why would I want to answer this question at all? From a public health perspective and from my psychiatrist's perspective with that hat on, well, patients with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder exhibit very high rates of suicide behavior. This is maybe not that well recognized, but uh, the lifetime death rate of uh, people with schizophrenia by uh, suicide is uh, at least 5%. And 25 to 50% of people with schizophrenia make a suicide attempt. So it is a, a pretty, very substantial uh, uh, public health problem. A and this public health problem, because people actually don't like to treat schizophrenia for the most part. These people, people with schizophrenia, in terms of the public health setting, tend to be shunned and put in the, back, uh, in the background. I remember going to the emergency rooms, and the patients were just sent home uh, 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 in ketoacidosis because they were schizophrenic and they didn't believe that they were sick. So, so the, this is an un, un uh, uh, and people who are suicidal and schizophrenic represent yet another subpopulation. Many clinicians don't want to ask about suicide because they're afraid of the consequences of what, what do they do with, about, about it. Um, so, but, so it needs to be addressed, I would argue, and it's a major public health problem. It's valuable, I think, for all of us. So our, our null hypothesis that we have here is that suicidal behavior or perceived risk for imminent suicide behavior is similar during a two-year follow-up period uh, treatment with clozapine or olanzapine in patients with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder who are known to be at high risk for uh, suicide. So I think this is a reasonably well-articulated question. There's a lot of elements in it. It may be uh, longer than what you uh, often see, but I think it, it represents the, uh, the population, how long I'm going to study them, what I'm going to study. I chose clozapine because that was the drug of, that I was working with at the time. I chose olanzapine because it was the, at the time the study was done, it was considered to be the very best state of the art and one of the uh, uh, treatments for uh, schizophrenia at that time. Now, the consensus in the community has changed a bit since then, but it's still regarded as a very good treatment. Now, the design was a two-year study. It was multi-center. It was international in 60 centers around the world. Uh, it was randomized. It was open label. And let me talk about that a little bit, uh, uh, about the open labelness. It turns out that although clozapine and olanzapine are both actually chemically quite similar to one another, their side effect profile is dramatically different. And basically, you can't, uh, you can't blind the two drugs. Um, because there's a number of side effects, including hypersalivation and so forth, that it's very, very difficult to do it. But the investigators who were working with them, we were also working in a uh, population of people with schizophrenia and who had a attempted suicide within the last year or were very highly suicidal and need to be hospitalized for suicide ideation at that time. The clinicians said, we can't, we can't, bl uh, we can't blind this study because it's unethical. We need the flexibility to manage these patients and know what they're on. And it, there's so, the treatment condition is so severe and the outcomes are so severe that they wanted that flexibility. Beyond that, clozapine causes agranocytosis 
in about 1% of the population and requires regular uh, uh, blood draws. Uh, and you, that's not required for a lanzapine. So you, you, we had to do those blood drops to do the treatment. That, that difference may have been the difference in suicidal, ide, uh, uh, suicidal behaviors that we might observe. So we required that everybody come in for visits and have some level of observation at a weekly basis for the first six months and then biweekly thereafter so that we manage that. Now, that's cl clearly not a real world but it was an absolute requirement for the safety of the study. Uh, uh, we ultimately studied 980 patients for uh, two years. Uh, we uh, uh, pa patients uh, were, after randomization, except for changing the primary medication, unless the clinician felt that the, it was uh, bad, the, uh, usually they couldn't switch to another antipsychotic and stay in the study. Uh, but they, I mean, if, if the medication was unsafe in some ways, they could be pulled out. Um, the endpoints were very hard endpoints, but they were suicide attempts, or they were suicide, and that, this included death by suicide, because an attempt is preceded, I mean, a, a death is preceded by an attempt. It was hospitalizations to prevent an attempt, because we, we, in order to be ethical about this, we required that at every visit, that we record how suicidal that patient was. It was deemed unethical, given the potential bad outcome, not to ask about it. And we think that that is good clinical practice that should probably be done in every case, but we had to insist on it in this case. But because, and we had to intervene to prevent the suicide if we found that they were highly suicidal. So a hospitalization to prevent a suicide attempt was considered an endpoint. And then we also, uh, we took a very different uh, uh, endpoint as part, part of the overall mix. If there was much worsening in their suicidality at a visit as rated by the clinician, that was also considered an endpoint. Then we had blinded raters who made the assessments, and we had a suicide monitoring board who ultimately judged whether or not an event had occurred or not, and both of them were blinded. Um, I think I've, in... I've gone through most of the points on this slide already, uh, but one, one that's not here is that in order to do the assessments, and there, uh, there really were not scales to assess suicidality out there at the time, so we actually had to develop some new scales in order to s assess and sort of regular, regularize the assessment of suicidality. So what were the results of the study? Uh, after two years of follow-up, uh, we found that fewer patients uh, treated with clozapine exhibited any suicidal behavior endpoint uh, as compared to olanzapine. Um, it's, more specifically, there were fewer pa patients that attempted uh, uh, suicide with clozapine. There were fewer required hospitalizations with clozapine. There were few, r fewer required rescue interventions with clozapine. And the FDA came back to us with some questions about, well, because you allowed, in terms of other treatments, concomitant th therapies could be given to either group. Maybe there was some equalness in the application of concomitant therapies. As it turned out, there were fewer concomitant therapies given with the clozapine group than in the olanzapine group. Um, and this was both with respect to concomitant antidepressants and anxiolytics. On the other hand, uh, a, a related question of who died by suicide. I mean, fortunately, in this very, 1,000 patients who were at very high risk for suicide, the interventions probably uh, uh, prevented suicide in a lot of patients because we were following them. So we saw the difference in the context of non-real-world uh, non clinical behavior because we felt we had it, had to do that. But there were actually more deaths in the clozapine group, but there were only uh, nine deaths altogether. Or actually, in, in this context, of it, there was one that occurred just outside of the two-year limit, so that was nine. Uh, but uh, there, there were um, eight within the context of the two years. And there were uh, two more on clozapine. But that wasn't the question. Uh, but it is interesting. It has been a criticism of the study a bit. But it, the study would have required over 10,000 patients to answer that question. And this sort of gives a graph of, of, of how uh, the difference occurred over time. So uh, what is the summary 
finding from this study is that suicidal behavior or its perceived risk for suicide, uh, uh, for imminent suicide, was not similar between the two groups. Uh, we didn't take the, the study any further than that, but we were able to take this information to the FDA, and the FDA agreed in the context of the other information that they had regarding safety and efficacy <laughs> of the drug that this, this study could be applied to the label as well. So the next study is uh, also in schizophrenia. Um, and in this case, we're studying, uh, again, antipsychotics, but injectable antipsychotics, uh, which I was working with, compared to oral antipsychotics. And the goal of this particular study uh, was to determine if long-term treatment with an injectable antipsychotic uh, uh, has clinical and economic advantages over oral antipsychotic medications who are provided to patients with schizophrenia who had recently been released from incarceration. So again, why is this an important public health question? Well, since institutionalization, deinstitutionalization in the 1960s started, it started actually in 63 and continued and uh, has progressed to the day so that there's very few uh, large mental hospitals. And there may have been a problem w with the way mental health care was provided by the large mental hospitals, but we've decided in the United States to replace that by imprisoning many of our, our, our mentally ill. And so that the largest uh, psychiatric hospitals in the, in the United States are the county jails in, in uh, Los Angeles and in Cook County and in Florida, Dade County. So our, our mentally ill are, tend to be incarcerated. What we also learned in the context of this, and there's a lot of public health data, is that once you're incarcerated, it's really easy to get reincarcerated, particularly if you're mentally ill and you're discharged in the middle of the night, as you often are, without any medication and without any place to stay. Um, so, uh, and as it turns out, it's much more costly to treat people in a, in a jail than it is to give them good uh, mental health treatment. But nonetheless, we, we tend to imprison our, our uh, psychiatric patients. So the null hypothesis in this particular study is, is an injectable medication um, uh, better in terms of treat, uh, reducing treatment failure. And we define treatment failure as a hospitalization, a reincarceration, or adding an antipsychotic to prevent a treatment failure. And is that, uh, is that similar then to giving uh, uh, an oral antipsychotic medication uh, over a 15 month period in patients with schizophrenia who have been recently incarcerated? So the design of this trial was a 15-month multi-center. This one is always, all of the centers were, the, were in the United States, where we have this pr public health approach. Uh, it was randomized. It was open label again, because it would have uh, been impossible to blind this, because an injection is different than giving an oral medication. And logistically, first of all, we already knew that all of these medications were relatively safe and effective, because they all of them had, a, had a regulatory approval for use. Um, and does, are, is, are these treatment modalities, injection versus oral, the same uh, when given to people with schizophrenia um, uh, who have been recently incarcerated? Now, we took a fairly different approach here uh, in that we, uh, there was a double randomization. Patients coming into the study uh, in the 60 centers uh, that we uh, uh, identified had to agree that they would, first of all, be uh, either get an injection or, or an oral medication. They would, they would be a flip of the coin of what, which one they got. If they were randomized to the oral medication, they, there was a choice of seven medications that were the most commonly used ones, but they could deselect in advance of that, random, that, that second randomization, they could deselect the ones they didn't like. So why would they go on a medication that they had had bad uh, effects on or that the clinician did not like? And so one of these medications, Heloperidol, the cheapest one, was the one with, which is almost always deselected. And uh, the results with, with that particular one is that it had the worst outcome in the very few people that even got it. Uh, but the randomization was, was first a deselection, and then amongst those that they remain in the eligibility list, uh, 
uh, they could be randomized and they would then be treated to, uh, for 15 months. Again, post-randomization, there could be changing of medication, but they couldn't stay in the study if they moved from an oral to an injectable medication, because then we can't answer our question any longer. Uh, time to suicide, time to uh, hospitalization, time to arrest were um, the, the events, or to an intervention to prevent an arrest. The key considerations, uh, I think, again, I've gone through most of them. I think the, the, in both of these, there was very specific statistical methodologies that I don't have time to go into that were considered uh, in terms of how we would do this. Uh, what was the results? Well, we studied 400, close to 450 patients, ultimately in 51 sites. Uh, the treatment failure was 1.4 times higher with oral uh, antipsychotics than with an injectable antipsychotic. The mean days to treatment failure was almost six months longer uh, in the, uh, if uh, they, they received the injectable. And in re arrest, incarceration, and psychiatric hospitalization were the most common of the endpoints that we saw, and there was statistical significance in pre preventing those as well. Uh, uh, so just identifying them to be at potential show risk and intervening, actually, although we allowed it, didn't happen very often. We then went on to model the results uh, using uh, uh, very sophisticated health uh, economic modeling, and we were able to show in that uh, in that, that overall, the, the, uh, if we model this data, that it could be modeled against the Medicare database, and that uh, with that matching modeling technique, that uh, uh, if this, these same algorithm were applied to a Medicare population, we would be saving uh, in excess of $3 billion a year uh, 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 over an 18-month period. So basically, we're showing that, that it's not similar to give an injectable uh, versus an oral medication with the, uh, injectables being superior, and that there's an economic potential economic advantage to giving uh, the injectable medication. And with that, I thank you.